On January 11th, the Israeli parliament passed an amendment to the so-called infiltrators law. This revision allows the authorities to automatically imprison asylum seekers for three years. According to Amnesty International, this puts Israel at the top of the Western world for length of imprisonment of refugees. Today, Israel is home to nearly 50,000 asylum seekers from Africa, 85% of whom are from Eritrea and Sudan. This amendment adds to a plan approved in 2010 to build a large-scale detention facility for asylum seekers in the Negev Desert in southern Israel. This will be the biggest refugee prison of any developed country. The day this amendment was passed, hundreds of Israeli activists blocked major intersections in Tel Aviv. Nick Schlagman is the humanitarian coordinator of ARDC, the African Refugee Development Center in Tel Aviv. The main change that this new law will bring is the amount of time that the government are able to hold people in detention. Until now, the government have difficulty holding people for longer than 60 days in detention. Uh, and this meant that their desire to open a large camp in, in the desert uh, was approved by the finance ministry because the finance ministry simply stated that you can make a plan to build a camp for 10,000 people but you don't have the legislation in place to hold 10,000 people at any one time with the numbers who are coming through the border. So the passing of the inf anti-infiltration law now gives the government the power to hold people for up to three years um, which now means that the finance ministry are comfortable to allocate funds to the building of this large detention facility in the desert. Um, which they will expect to fill pretty quickly. Johan Bayou is the founder and executive director of the ARDC. He's himself a refugee from Ethiopia. Five, four thousand refugees were existed before 2005. But after Egypt killed some refugees in the demonstration in, 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 Ak in Cairo, those people felt they are not f safe to live there and they start coming. And not only that, Egypt are deporting people where their life will be in danger. Bayou is one of a handful of asylum seekers whose refugee claim was recognized by the government. Most claims do not even get heard, but refugees from certain countries get group asylum, such as those from Eritrea and Sudan. Most, like Ibrahim, who's been in Israel for 10 years, end up in a grey legal zone, forced to renew his visa every three or four months. Originally from Eritrea, Ibrahim was born in a Sudanese UN refugee camp. Having lost his family, he returned to Eritrea, where he was forced to be a child soldier at the age of 11. Ibrahim's journey to Israel isn't unique. Ran Cohen, Director of Physicians for Human Rights, describes the process of human smuggling from Africa into Israel. From what we collected from the uh, more than 900 interviews that we did here in the Open Clinic, it seems that, this, that there's a very wide network that basically starts in Sudan. Sometimes people are sold uh, from one group to the other three or four times. When they reach the Sinai Desert, they are being held sometimes for weeks or months. They are being demanded to pay the amounts now have been grown to sometimes thirty thousand or even forty thousand dollars per person in order to continue or to be to have their last to be released and have their last way into Israel. Israel is trading arms with African regimes, uh, including with uh, the regime in Eritrea. Israel has diplomatic relationships with Eritrea, so. Uh, 
from one aspect in Sudan, uh, at least South Sudan, so from one aspect, Israel, not the official Israel, but Israeli companies uh, will uh, trade arms and sell weapons to the Eritrean army, but when it comes to the results of that, then Israel is not willing to, to deal with that. The term infiltrators, or mistoninium in Hebrew, derives from the 1954 law, the new amendment, updated. It was originally passed to prevent Palestinian refugees of the 1948 war from getting back to the lands from which they were expelled to make way for the Jewish state. Because the refugees aren't Jewish, they can't immigrate to Israel and are instead subject to two laws, the entry to Israel law and the infiltrators law. Under the system, once they make it across the border, asylum seekers are detained by the Israeli army up to 10 days and are passed on to the Sahalonim prison on the border with Egypt. While most get released in a matter of months, the new amendment will keep them locked up for three years. And even if 10,000 people will be in detention, there will still be 40,000 people outside of detention. Uh, and according to current statistics, that prison will fill up within four or five months. Yes, and, and then what? Uh, of, co of course, part, part of the logic behind this plan is that if uh, asylum seekers in Israel will suffer so much and the situation will, here will be so bad, then uh, the hope of the government is that this message will be sent by asylum seekers to uh, uh, people in Egypt or in Eritrea and so on, uh, signaling that don't come to Israel, it's very bad over here. This year, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu finally made clear his three-point plan for dealing with asylum seekers. Imprisonment, punishment and deterrence. Under this plan, as soon as the refugees enter Israel, they will be jailed for three years. For this purpose, the government will construct the largest refugee detention center in the Western world, aimed to house 10,000 people. Unlike in Europe and North America, in Israel, these jails are run by the prison authority, not by civil service. Last week, Netanyahu announced authorities will also begin punishing employers who hire asylum seekers. Finally, for deterrence, the government began building a wall along the Egyptian border, like the segregation wall in the West Bank. was echoed by Netanyahu in a speech at the Manufacturers Association conference last year. A stream of refugees threatened to wash away our achievements and harm our existence as a Jewish and democratic state. In the report for the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, Jonathan Paz writes, the state's trial and error measures for dealing with the refugees have shaped the sense of non-policy, which has been described by others as chaotic bureaucratic ambiguity and governmental unruliness. However, behind this ostensible chaos or unruliness lies an ordering principle, which aims to deliver a clear and unwelcoming message. But according to Rand Cohen, the solution is both domestic and international. I'm talking about um, uh, checking individual cases, I'm talking about integration, I'm talking about uh, working in the origin countries to try and uh, maybe make the situation there a bit better uh, in order to uh, help people stay in their own countries and not choose to leave. <laughs> For The Real News, I'm Leah Turchansky in Tel Aviv.